Hi everyone, and welcome to Jane Talks Real. It's nostalgia time once again, and I'm going to be talking about Trapped. This was suggested to me by Zach, so thank you very much, Zach, and I hope you enjoy the video. Although Trapped wasn't a staple of my childhood like Gladiators, Raven, or The Crystal Maze, as I was 20 when it first aired, it still has a special nostalgic place in my heart because I watched it in my early 20s when I wasn't at work. Trapped saw a team of six kids, known as Unfortunates, come to the tower to compete under the watchful eye of the caretaker, who stopped by the tower for a nap and got himself, you guessed it, trapped by The Voice, played by Faith Brown from season two onwards. All you ever saw of The Voice was her mouth, and she forced the caretaker to keep trapping Unfortunates in order to win his freedom, which he never did as far as I'm aware. The other always present resident of the tower was Wily Sneak, who I always thought was kind of cute. I have no idea why he was trapped there. He probably stepped on the voice's lawn or something. But it was his job to demonstrate how each of the games worked. At the beginning of each episode, Wily would put the six unfortunates into a cage and signal up to the caretaker who would haul them up to the tower while giving random facts about each child. They always made me laugh because they were utter bullshit. Lewis, he was rescued by squirrels in 1892. Olivia, who used to be a beanbag, Ellis, who lives in a bit bean can. There's Chloe, who has a pet yogurt. Daniel, who keeps mashed potato in his ears. Mariah, who likes to sniff goldfish. The great thing about Trapped was it wasn't just a kid's TV show, it was a mind game. Because on each floor, one of the kids couldn't be trusted. Are you ready for the rules? Here we go. Each unfortunate would wear an earpiece known as a whisper clip that kind of looked like a shell. And before each challenge, the voice would secretly speak to one of the kids, telling them that they were that floor's saboteur, and it was their job to prevent the team from winning the game. She would tell them not to react to her voice or it would give them away, and while some of the kids would look slightly startled at the news that they were the saboteur, most would stay perfectly still, except for one kid who I remember danced around the whole time the voice was talking to him. But surprisingly, he wasn't discovered, I don't know how. Anyway. Once the game begins, the voice talks to the saboteur the whole time, guiding them through the game and telling them how to best sabotage their efforts. Tell them it must be the yellow books. It looks like all the yellow ones are bad. At the end of the game, if the saboteur was successful in messing up the game, each member of the team would have to vote for who they thought the guilty party was. And the person with the most votes would get trapped on that floor, whether they were the saboteur or not. You have voted for Ella. Some of these kids looked really offended to be accused. If, however, the unfortunates, despite the saboteur's best efforts, passed the game, they would get automatically trapped, even if the kids voted for someone else. If the voting resulted in a tie, You have voted for... Jadeen and... John. The tied unfortunates had to draw straws, with the short straw resulting in being trapped. All kids not trapped would jump through a trap door to the floor below and the process would begin again, but with a new saboteur. I never understood those kids who would vote for the person who was just the saboteur in the previous game, because I never saw anyone be picked to do it twice in a row, unless there were only three kids left. William, it's you again. By the time they got to floor two, there would only be two unfortunates left, and they would play a head-to-head -head game called One Way Out. They had 60 seconds to answer as many questions correctly about their time in the tower as they could, with the most points gaining the key of freedom and being allowed to leave. There were no prizes or anything for winning. You just got to escape while the rest of your team were trapped in the tower forever. Come to think of it, Trapped was basically a Saw movie. I'm glad that I was an adult when this came out because I know that little kid me would have believed that they were actually trapped forever and I wouldn't have been able to sleep at night. So that was the concept, now let's look at some of the challenges these unfortunate unfortunates had to face. A lot of the games were quite similar, so I'll be discussing them in groups. The persuasion games were the hardest in my opinion, and the ones that even as an adult I wouldn't want to be the saboteur in because I'm a terrible liar. These games involve trying to convince the others around you to pick certain things to fail the game. Snake Attack and Green Fingers were basically identical, except one was horizontal and one was vertical. There were a series of holes that you had to stick your hand in, and if you put your hand in the hole with a snake or green fingers three times, you'd fail the game. 
These came very much down to chance because although the voice would specify which holes were bad, the saboteur couldn't really control if they were listened to or not, and if they were, they were at risk of being detected as the traitor. I didn't particularly enjoy these games, especially Snake Attack, because at least with green fingers you were looking for plant bulbs, whereas a correct hole in Snake Attack was empty and why are these kids being forced to stick their hands in this wall again? The selection persuasion games were a little more interesting and these included Extraction, One-Eyed Watcher, Spooked and Beware the Crow Man. For these ones, the unfortunates were usually presented with objects and they had to determine which were good and which were bad. For example, in Spooked, which took place in the Tower Library, the unfortunates would have to present the very screamy librarian with a series of books and she would either pass them along or scream like a banshee. The good and bad books changed each time, so it could be the colour that set her off, the symbol, the size, or even the ribbon. Extraction was a good one and would have been terrifying for child me because I hated the game Crocodile Dentist and Extraction was basically that. A werewolf would be sat in a dentist chair and the kids had to pull out three rotten teeth to win. But of course the saboteur would be trying to direct the team to pull out good teeth and that would upset the werewolf. And Beware the Crow Man involved blowing out candles in jack-o'-lanterns without disturbing the terrifying scarecrow. Nope, no thank you. There were a couple of games I like to refer to as blackout sabotage games, and they usually involved constructing something and then when a blackout came, the saboteur would destroy their efforts. Body Shock saw the team construct a body and in the blackout, the voice would guide the saboteur to release creatures known as botherers to destroy the body. There were usually three blackouts per game and because it was completely dark, it was difficult for the saboteur to find the lever and return to their original position without knocking into anyone before the lights came back on. The other blackout game was the Wall of Sorrow, where the unfortunates had to construct a wall and then the saboteur would knock it down in the blackout. But they had to be careful where they destroyed it because if they did it in front of themselves, it could give them away. That was the most successful tactic of being a saboteur, framing someone. Many, many innocent unfortunates got trapped because they were framed by the real saboteur, especially on the higher floors where there were more people. Anyway, Wall of Sorrow had an epically bad fail on it, so bad that the game was sabotaged by the whole group while the saboteur just let it happen. Apparently, one group of kids didn't get how a wall worked and just stacked the bricks randomly on top of one another with big gaps in them. There was no hope for the team, so unsurprisingly, they failed miserably. But the saboteur got incredibly unlucky. When the kids were asked to vote who they thought the saboteur was, it came down to a tie between Josh, the actual saboteur, and Ellie, an innocent unfortunate. Josh drew the short straw and he was trapped. Unlucky, dude. The next set of games were hiding games, where the group would complete a task and then have to hide, giving the saboteur a few seconds to mess up their efforts before they all came out again. These type of challenges included septic sewers, camp fear, and giant appetite. Septic sewers had the unfortunates plug up a drain with 12 plugs, which was very easy to do with five of them. So when they were all sucked up the pipes, the saboteur had to remove plugs and throw them wherever and get back in their pipe with only a few seconds to do it. The important component for this game was that the drain rotated so the saboteur could remove plugs in front of themselves, then spin the drain to one of the other kids so they looked guilty. Camp Fear was a little complicated and took place on floor three. The unfortunates had to build a campfire out of nine logs and when completed it would glow orange. When this was done, they had to go inside the tents and the saboteur would come out, have to put out the fire, which seemed like a pointless step, and dismantle the logs. Doing this would not only hamper the team's efforts, but it would also bring forth this goat creature called the Moon Howler, which, yes, was a little freaky, but the saboteur would often get spooked by it, dive back into their tent and not really sabotage anything. It's not gonna hurt you. It's no scarier than the bother is the librarian or that French lady who screamed a lot into a mirror. I always wondered in this game why the saboteur didn't throw one or more of the logs behind someone's tent. It would have made it harder to find and rebuild and also would have framed someone nicely. Now Giant's Appetite I have to mention for a few reasons. This game involved setting the giant's table and when he comes fee fi fo fumming to dinner, the kids had to hide under the table and it was an opportunity for the saboteur to push everything off the table. This game was very stacked in the saboteur's favour because the giant would come three times and they had much longer to wreck everything than they did in septic sewer especially. But on top of that, the third giant appearance 
would happen too close to the end of the game, so it was pretty much guaranteed that the saboteur would be out and sabotaging when the timer ran out, making it impossible for the team to pass. Honestly, this is the one I would have wanted to be the saboteur for because it seemed like the easiest challenge to mess up without being detected. But that wasn't always the case, and this boy is the other reason I wanted to discuss this game. His name is Ishmael, and he was the saboteur. Now, Ishmael was so small that he barely reached the table, and when the giant came, giving him the opportunity to sabotage, all he had the confidence to do was move the oversized salt and pepper grinders off the table just above his hiding space and put them on the floor, right next to his hiding space. Even though he was successful in causing the group to fail, thanks to the aforementioned game loophole, he was unsurprisingly detected by the rest of his team and trapped. Poor little guy, I hope he wasn't too traumatised by the experience. There were a couple of games that didn't really fit into any categories I've mentioned so far, and they were the only one of their kind, so they were my favourite games because they were so different. The first of these was The Goblet of Ice. How did you put your name in the Goblet of Ice? This one didn't feature all that often, and while it was easy to sabotage, it was hard to get away with. There was a goblet and some stepping stones, and the unfortunates had to go across the stepping stones and fill up the goblet with these little polystyrene balls you get inside a beanbag. If the goblet was full at the end of the game, the team passed. But if anyone put a foot on the floor at any point, the goblet would empty. While you could put your foot down or hope someone else lost balance, the stepping stone course was a circuit, so you always had people in front and behind you no matter where you were, making it easy for someone else to spot you deliberately putting your foot down. I think this game could have been altered slightly to make it less impossible for the saboteur. Are we ready for my favourite game of the main series? It was called Forbidden Chambers and it was the only game where you never saw any of your other teammates. This was a floor 3 game and it involved a four chambered room and different coloured boxes. Apparently these boxes contained smelly creatures known as Jub Jubs, but it honestly didn't really matter. So what the unfortunates had to do was stack all the boxes of the same colour in the matching coloured chamber. Sounds simple, right? Except for the rules, that you could only carry one type of colour at a time, and you couldn't move into a room that was already occupied by another unfortunate. Three kids, four rooms, meant that at all times, one of the kids would be sandwiched between the other two and wouldn't be able to move. The only way to advance was to shout to your teammates and try and convince them to move into a different room, but this could be easily sabotaged by hoarding boxes and refusing to move. It was also easy to frame someone too by shouting to the other player that they are constantly blocking you in. It was pure chaos and I loved it. So that was Trapped, but we're not finished yet because season 4 changed to become Trapped Ever After, a fairy tale spin on the original format, and I loved it. The caretaker was the same, except his room was redone, but Wily Sneak had a buzz cut gothic makeover. I think I preferred his original design, but his new look fit with the theme. The voice also got some different lipstick, which looked way messier than it did before, and several new characters took up residence in the tower, but we'll talk about them later. The rules of the game remained the same, except on floor 2 the remaining unfortunates were chained to a wall and asked a series of questions. A correct answer would allow you to take a step forward, while an incorrect one granted that gift to your opponent. The first to take four steps won the key of freedom and escaped the tower. All the games were changed for Ever After, so I'm going to give a quick rundown of some of them. Miss Mutternot the Librarian was back again in Mutternot's Tales, where the kids had to upend books like dominoes, but a blackout would allow the saboteur to knock all of them down again. The Lost Invitations must have been a pain to reset each time, because the kids would run around a post office, ripping open envelopes looking for six invitations. If they found one, they had to go into the booth, stamp it, and post it to the creature down below but if it was ripped, it didn't count. There was one poor kid who was pretty shell-shocked by the whole thing and didn't do anything unless instructed to by the voice, which made him look really suspicious. And on top of that, one of the girls was stood in front of the booth when he ripped an invite and she saw him. Unsurprisingly, he was trapped. Poisoned Hollow wouldn't be worth mentioning because it was exactly the same as Septic Sewers, only with apples, except for this boy who was an amazing saboteur. Everyone else would remove the apples and then spin the plate they were on, but he spun first and used the momentum to knock them all off. On top of that, he managed to knock one of the apples into the hollow of another unfortunate, so that she looked hella suspicious when they tried to put all the apples back in place. 
Despite the poor girl being the saboteur on the previous floor and therefore extremely unlikely to be it on this one, she was stitched up, voted for and trapped. Are you ready for the most complicated game setup of them all? This one was called The Wolf and the Nut and it involved Scarlet the Wolf Hunter, whose grandma was eaten by a wolf and she swore to cut its head off, but then caught, caught in the rain and ended up at the tower, where the voice gave her a bed for the night, but the bed has nuts in it so she can't sleep, and oh by the way, there's a wolf living in the mattress. I'm sorry, what? Okay, trapped ever after, whatever you say. For each side of the bed, the kids had to stick their hand in the top, middle, or bottom mattress and try and pull out a nut. But the saboteur would try and direct them to be bitten by the wolf. Aww, look at that gorgeous wolf snout! All the while, Scarlet would be chatting to them from on top of the bed. She was kind of annoying, but at least she made a pretty boring game more interesting. There were a few more games. The Midnight Bride, which reminded me of a game of Guess Who, Millicent and the Moths, Scallywag Wood and A Child for Tea, which featured Psycho Mrs. Doubtfire, but my two favourite games from Trapped Ever After were Split Ends and The Frozen Princess. Split Ends was a pretty standard persuasion game, but the setup was awesome. Split Ends was basically gothic Rapunzel, and you had to undo bows in her miles of hair without making her scream. Of all the characters in Trapped, this is the one I would have wanted to play. This one also had an interesting four-way voting tie in one of the episodes. Unfortunates, you have all received one vote. You obviously don't trust each other. But it didn't matter, because the team had passed, automatically trapping the saboteur in the room. The Frozen Princess had a basic rule. Put five flowers in the princess's hand and have them still there when the time runs out. Now, unlike games like Split Ends and The Midnight Bride, what would disturb the princess wasn't anything to do with the flowers or the kids. The princess would wake up and throw her flowers if the saboteur said a particular word. This changed every time and included scream, Don't scream. <laughs> princess, frozen princess, wait, wait one minute page, and careful. Be really, really careful. It was up to the saboteur how they wanted to use the word, but some kid didn't understand the rules and just randomly blurted it out instead of saying it in the sentence. Somehow she wasn't detected and someone else took the blame. Finally, before I sign off, because I'm aware of just how long this episode is going to be, I've got to talk about my favourite contestant in Ever After. Episode 2 featured identical twins Megan and Kimberly. After the saboteur was trapped on floor 6 and an innocent unfortunate got the blame on floor 5, floor 4 saw Megan be the saboteur in split ends, and after she successfully sabotaged the game, Kimberly stuck by her twin as they both voted for PJ, trapping him on the floor. But the sister act was not to last, because floor 3 was Scallywag Wood, where it was Kimberly's turn to be the saboteur. And not only did she successfully sabotage the game, she also got away with it by throwing Megan under the bus and getting her trapped. After this baller move, it was little wonder that she nailed the quiz on floor 2 and won her freedom. Amazing. So there you have it, that was Trapped. Did you watch this one as a kid, and what were your favourite games? Would you have wanted to be the saboteur? And what did you think of Ever After? Let me know in the comments or come say hi on social media. If you enjoyed this video, then please like, share and subscribe. Join me next time where I'll be talking about a dating show with a Laura Laura laughs. I'll speak to you soon and thanks for watching.